That means that the whole concept of inevitability gets its meaning from the perspective in which, a perspective in which there are agents, in which there are agents that might want to avoid something. And it might be in their power or it might not. Now there's, if we start looking at particular worlds with particular agents and particular circumstances in them, we can now start saying, well, in this world, what things are avoidable? What kinds of things are avoidable by this agent given its powers and its circumstances? And the answer may be, well, if you throw a brick at it, it can duck because uh, uh, there's enough light so it'll be able to see the brick and its nervous system is good enough and its reflexes are fast enough so that it's pretty good at avoiding bricks. However, a random lightning bolts is no good at avoiding those. You know, it's just doomed. If, if there's a lightning stroke coming up in its future, it's, it's toast. There's nothing it can do about that. But if you, if you try, uh, uh, you know, to throw a spear at it or something, your chances of, of succeeding are, are, are next to nil because it's such a good spear avoider. Now, in order to be able to talk this way, in order to partition the universe into the th things that are inevitable for that or agent or evitable by that agent, uh, we have to have a way of talking about evitability and inevitability in a, in a deterministic world. Now, since there's plenty of evitability in deterministic worlds that we can define, the implication, you know, determinism implies inevitability is just false. It's just a mistake. Okay. And so it's thousands of years old. It's not been pointed out. It's just a mistake. So natural selection creates harm avoiders. It's uh, natural selection is an explosion of evitability. We've had huge increases in the degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. The powers that the products of evolution have, the accrued powers, uh, this is one of the most obvious facts in the physical world. Mm -hmm. It's this growth of evitability. Now, now, if evitability, if you look at evitability in that way, then you see that just the, the, the traditional philosopher's notion of inevitability just isn't in the same picture. And, and you could say that we are future alterers, at least in the sense that, had we not evolved the capacities we have for harm avoidance, yeah. the future would have been otherwise. And, yeah. and you have to be very careful when you talk about future alterers. Right. Because what are you going to change the future? From what to what? <laughs> Since it hasn't happened. But you can talk about yeah. what it would have been had I not evolved my That's uh, right. yeah. whatever it yeah. is I yeah. use to avoid harm. Um, but, of course, the reply you get from people is, Yes, but you're still saying that given the fact that I have evolved these things, given the condition in which I wake up this morning yep. and the way my brain is inclined to use these things, yep. the future is inevitable. And my feeling that I, that, that I need to, well, you, you certainly hear this as a reply. You right? certainly do, but, but I'm going to say, what on earth do you mean my future is inevitable? Well, but that again, if you knew that an omniscient being could predict what's going to happen today and there's no possibility that I will behave in a way that's going to change, that's going to, make, that's going to falsify that prediction. That's what people mean. Well, first of all, that would be true, if I understand you right, in an indeterministic universe too. Well, no, in that universe, the omniscient well, being yes. would, would, take, would do the calculation and go, I think this is going to happen, but... Whoa, Caprice enters the picture magically. No, the, om the omniscient being is going to know the future. Well, no, omniscient about the present, I mean, and the laws that govern the present. So okay. you mean a Laplacian being? Yeah, a Laplacian yeah, calculator. And then, but lo and behold, uh, T plus one after the prediction is made, Caprice enters the picture from we know not yeah. where. That's the traditional conception of free will. And, and, and people have to let that's go of a, that. That's a traditional conception of free will. Right. And what I'm arguing is that it's, uh, it's gratuitous. It, it does not... The motivation people have imagined for it is simply mistaken. Allowing for quantum indeterminacy, or shall we call it Laplacian indeterminacy, does not give you any more powers, any more freedom, any more 
avoidability, any more evitability than you have in a deterministic world. It's just an illusion to think that it does. Okay. You say in the book that, and this is maybe one example, but uh, that uh, free will lacks the tra your conception of the kind of free will that's viable uh, lacks some of the traditional properties mm -hmm. associated with free will. Have we yeah. already covered all the traditional properties, or are there other things people are going to have to let go of? Um, I, I'll let other people make that calculation. I've tried, I mean, what, what I claim is that all the varieties of free will that are worth wanting, we can have in a deterministic world. That the, I can define varieties of free will that are incompatible with determinism, but they're pointless. They, they, don't, they don't give you anything that matters. They, don't give you, they, they aren't needed for moral responsibility. They aren't needed to give your life meaning. They're, they are completely gratuitous. Uh, they're sort of bizarre metaphysical conceits. They don't pull their weight. You don't need them. Who cares? Yeah. I mean, I have to admit, I've never been able to clearly conceive a free will, even though it feels like I have it. Uh, but, yeah. but if you try to draw a graph of it, you'll run into trouble. I mean, I can imagine determinism. I can imagine a determined system. I can kind of imagine a random one, although that's actually harder than it seems. Um, but, but free will is, is a slightly fuzzy concept. Um, on the issue of quantum physics, though, I, I, uh, I wanted to raise it like a, a kind of a, a, a second um, uh, dimension of quantum physics that, that, might, that might enter the picture. I, I, as I understand um, what you're saying about quantum physics and free will is, is you're kind of saying, I mean, first we should say that according to quantum physics, there, there is such a thing as truly True. indeterminate. Yep. Uh, at the quantum level, very microscopic level, things happen that you could not in principle predict even if you had all the information in the physical universe. That's right. Uh, as, as Richard Feynman put it, nature herself does not know what she is going to do next yep. at the quantum level. And some people have tried to use that to bring free will into the picture because mm -hmm. it is anti-deterministic. I think I agree with you that, look, lots of random fluctuations, even in the brain, if they're truly random, don't amount to what people usually mean by free will. Good. So we don't need randomness, or at least randomness can't give us free will. If it's true randomness, you would think not. On the other hand, I would say one thing about quantum physics is um, you can't really know if random is the right word if you don't know what's causing the thing. I mean... Well, no, but that's what random means in quantum physics. No hidden variables. Uh, well, no hidden variables in the physical universe, right. But... Yeah. but, but um, let me put it another way. I mean, in, in the quantum world, events happen for which there is no cause in the physical universe. I mean, right. which is kind of weird. But, 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 but let me bring up a, a different weird aspect of quantum physics that may bear on free will. Um, the, uh, it's this business of the idea that the process of measurement or observation brings uh, quantum reality into definite existence, okay, that, that this is one interpretive, we're already getting into yeah. the interpretive yeah, part of quantum say, physics, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, but Collapse are, of the wave packet. Right, yes. there are reputable physicists who, who say this, and there are two different ways to put it. One is that uh, it's just that the, the quantum, uh, a quantum particle or whatever encounters a macroscopic measuring device, and that alone causes it to assume finite form. But some serious physicists think, no, you actually need a like a conscious being observing the measuring device to bring the thing into mm -hmm. uh, reality. Now, if uh, into fixed uh, finite reality, if they're right, that would seem to me to open up the possibility of free will in a different sense. I mean, what they're what they're saying is that there's something you know we don't entirely understand about uh, sentient being. I mean, yes, yes, I can see where you're going. Okay, and and. Uh, um, by by wedding two bits of magic together, you're going to say it's not magic. By me letting consciousness be a sort of mysterious and magical property and saying that qu uh, uh, quantum uh, enlargement, in effect, depends on consciousness, uh, you nicely tie together two, uh, two themes. Uh, and I think uh, uh, they're both... Uh, this is just magical thinking, and, we, and there's no reason to believe, believe either side of it. Okay. That is, that is <clears throat> it's important to your view, as you just put it, 
that there'd be something really perplexing and mysterious about about sentience, about consciousness. And uh, I, of course, uh, deny that. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm, okay, we've gotten to the part of the discussion where I'm afraid we, <coughs> we have to talk about consciousness. 